Alrighty, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us live for all those that did make it uh, this week. Uh, just a reminder, if anybody does want to join us uh, live, you could join the WhatsApp group or email me at rabbizitronatoraanytime.com. Uh, the WhatsApp group, the description is in the YouTube uh, um, comments. Um, I should find a way to put it also in the Torah Anytime comments because that's where you should be going, <laughs> not to the YouTube. You should be going to toraanytime.com. Uh, so maybe we should try to put that uh, you know, over there as well. In any case, um, uh, well, we have to welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers now that we're speaking about Torah Anytime. Just as a reminder, Torah Anytime did make a event, a raising money event last, no, this past Monday. I don't know when this is going to go up, but hopefully sooner rather than later, but they did make an event this past uh, Monday and they are still working towards a goal. So you still have the ability to go and donate to ama this amazing organization. And you could also be a part of it. You could have this chusim, uh, you know, in, in, in everything that they, that they do. But let's moving uh, straight on to the topic at hand. So to, oh, tonight we're learning the Fuash Lama. Two. Avram, Yaakov, Benyal, and Chavabat Chaya Esther, and Avram ben Adel. And we're also learning Leilu Nishmat, Rabbi Avram ben Chaim Yehuda, and Yechezkel ben Avram. Okay, so now the this is the fourth class, I believe, of the second Mishnah. It's always fascinating then when you go and you realize the volume and the depth of, like, the Torah in itself, you know, like you think about it, there's one Mishnah in Perkei Avos, and we're doing about four hours on one Mishnah in Perkei Avos, and I, you know, I, I generally don't do a lot of fluff, I do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I go through the, the topics, and you can see how much, uh, how much there actually is, you know, on it, which is really fascinating, and this is also fascinating to me, because even you know, like when, when I learn something is very different. If, if, if I'm learning something, it, it comes my, the way that I approach a subject is different than if I'm teaching the subject. So, which shouldn't be that way. Uh, and it's my fault that it is, but it is that way for me. And that, that's why what sometimes you, I, you know, I've been teaching, you know, well, I, I've been learning Perky for many years. I've been teaching it on and off, but when you start really going into the depth of it, even it's, a, it's a surprising fact when you see how much of volume and how much depth is, is just in one Mishnah. And again, we're not going through everything. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scra scraping the, the surface. But so this, and in any case, this is this, this is the, the fourth class in this Mishnah, or the second Mishnah in Perkei Elvis, that Shimon Atzadik Haya Mishare Knesses Hagdela. The Shimon Atzadik was from the remnants of the Ajik Knesses Hagdela, who I used to say, this is the, 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 the Mishnah we're dealing with. Three things the world stands Torah, Voda, and Gemilas Hasadim. So let's get down uh, to the business over here. The foundations of everything the Mishnah is telling us is Torah Avoda, which is is sacrificial uh, sacrifices, but now it's referred to as prayer, and Gmila Sasadam, which is chesed, which is kindness, which is good deeds. So we we'll try to get through each of these subjects. I hope to get through all three of them tonight, but we'll see as the time allows us. So the first one is Torah. Now, when you look at the Torah, we know Tamil Torah connected Kulam, the, the Torah is of the highest level, and in fact, the way that the Mishnah put it in was in order of prominence. And Torah came first because, as the Mishnah tells us, Talmud Torah connected Kulam. Torah is the highest thing, and it's connected. It's, 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 it's like you, when you learn Torah, it's like you fulfill all the mitzvahs. It has, it has the highest level out of everything. And to, to take it even higher is that the Gemara and Shabbos tells us, the Gemara and Shabbos page page 88a, tells us that when you look at the creation of the world, the creation of the world was done in seven days, where it was on six days, the seventh day was... Did I freeze again? The seventh day is the day of rest, but six days the world was created. Now, when at the end of each day, the Torah tells us, Vayer vayvaker yoyim echad. Vayer vayvaker yoyim sheini. Vayer vayvaker yoyim shlishi. Meaning, it, it, it was, it, it tells us that this is what, this is the first day, this is the second day, this is the third day. There's one day that sticks out more than anything else, and that is Vayer vayvaker yoyim ha shishi. The sixth day. Meaning, every other day, it says, this was the third day, this was the second day, this is the, you know, I shouldn't say the, because I'm saying it wrong. The, this was second day, this was first day, this was, uh, you know, third day. 
in the sixth day, it says this was the ha, meaning the the the, the prefix of, of hey is is an emphasis on the the. This was the sixth day. So ask the Gemara, what is so special about the sixth day? So you could say you know Adam was created. This is where man was created, but the Gemara doesn't go that way. The Gemara says. Actually, one of the interpretations of the Gemara says that the Reish Lakish says that this is referring to the sixth day. What's the sixth day? It's referring to the sixth day of Sivan, which is the day the Torah was given. And the Gemara learns from this that the whole purpose of the creation of the world was so the Jews would accept the Torah on the sixth day of Sivan, which we're coming up to, the Kabbalah Torah. And this says, uh, says the Gemara, this is how important the, uh, um, the you know Torah is, that this is what the world was based on. This is the foundation of the world and this was on the top of the on the top of the list and Gemara in Psachim page 68b says that without the Torah if there wouldn't be Torah there would not be the world would not exist after the Torah was given there's always Torah learning if there would not be Torah learning the world would would uh, would cease to would cease to exist and in fact the 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 understanding of why Torah is on the top of the list makes a lot of sense because you won't be able to do any mitzvot without the Torah right you ha- how are you going to go and learn to keep Shabbos how are you going to learn to go and put on tefillin to dress modestly like all these things things, you don't have a way to figure it out unless you have the instruction manual. And the instruction manual is the Torah. And furthermore, that is for, uh, um, you know, for the mitzvahs, so, you know, for the sacrifices. Also, if you don't have the Torah, you won't know how to do it. Morality, if you don't have the Torah, then you won't have moral concepts such as right and wrong would be, you know, just based on whatever, you know, uh, um, time period you're living in. If you're living in this time period, then, you know, certain moral, certain things are considered moral and certain things are considered immoral. If you would be living 2,000 years ago, certain things would be considered immoral that would be considered moral world today that you know and vice versa so morality changes uh, relative morality changes depending on the time that you're uh, uh, that you're living in but Torah always stays the same so if you want to know the real morality if you want to know the real chesed if you want to know the real way to pray you want to know the real way to do sacrifices that is all the Torah so the Torah has all the the foundation of you know of anything of everything and anything so the <clears throat> the idea of this also you know, it comes into light when we look at, at you know, the current events and what things going on and what uh, um, has been happening, what you see in the most elite campuses, the most elite colleges, institutions that are supposed to be the highest level of education are dumber than the lowest level. Like, if I were to compare some elite levels of education and prisons, I would, you know, like... At this stage, I would say that Harvard has a certain morality that I think prisons might have more. Just when you understand when the, you know the, the level of ignorance, the level of like like you know, because the way that it works is the smarter that you think you are, the more that you think you know, um, and the more ignorant you come off as being. If you don't think yourself as so smart, then you'll be more open to understanding concepts, and the less ignorant you will tend to tend to be, and you have. Have the, the when you look at it and you see people that want to give charity. So historically, a lot of people have been giving to these, uh, you know, secular educations. Of course, what's better than going and helping the society? Will produce more doctors, more lawyers, uh, you know, more dentists, more accountants. You'll able, yeah, it, it will, it will help the economy. It will help the people. It will help every. That's the way that secular people think. But now, when you come into the actual realization of what's coming out of it, that morality is disrupted, that the whole ideology of what they're teaching now, people are not donating anymore to these causes. So when you look at it from a secular idea, again, at one point, people will donate to this. Now they're not donating to this, they're changing it. But if you would have looked at the Torah, I'd be like, okay, wait a minute, if I'm giving charity, where is the best place for me to place the charity? Is the best place for me to pl- you know, put it in a secular education or maybe I should put it in a Torah education? So if you look at the Torah, you could see the, the, the answers has not changed, has always stayed the same. Morality is constantly changing. So if you want to know the foundation of everything, the foundation of everything is of the Torah. The more that you learn, the more that you understand, the more that you have clarity of where you're you're supposed to do your kindness, where and how you're supposed to pray, where and how you're supposed to do the mitzvahs. Everything lies in the foundation of the Torah. Now, the Gemara 
In Tainus, page 21a, tells a very fascinating and famous story about Nachum Ishgamzu. So Nachum Ishgamzu um, uh, was the he, he was the Rebbe of Rabbi Akiva, and he was blind in both eyes. His arm he didn't have arms, he didn't have legs towards the end of his life. And his body was also covered in in boils. And he was this he was lying in this dilapidated house that was about to fall down. And to, to tell you the, the situation, right? So you have this huge rabbi, no arms, no legs, boils and blind. Like, like you know, and he's sitting in this house that's dilapidated, that was about to fall down. And to make matters worse, how, how there was like an animal problem, let's just call it. And how would, how would the, the rabbi prevent the animals or the ants, let's say, from climbing onto his bed? Was that he had to put the the legs of the bed in in buckets of water, so that the ants wouldn't be wouldn't be able to climb into the water and then up the bed because he had no way of like, you know, removing any he didn't have any hands or any any legs. Just to tell you, just to paint a little picture on what this is the greatest rabbi of the generation, and this is how he's living in this dilapidated house with no arms or legs, and he had to have buckets of water so that the ants don't go and climb on his on his body. So the students wanted to remove, it's a dilapidated house, it was a house that was going to fall down. They wanted to remove the rabbi so that uh, um, they shouldn't, uh, the, the house shouldn't collapse on him. So the rabbi stops him and says, don't, before you move me from this house, take all the vessels, take everything that's of, of value and take it out of the house. Because as long as I'm in the house, it's not going to collapse. So uh, the students, they listen to the rabbi, they, they go and they take everything out, and then once they finish, they take out the rabbi's bed and they bring it outside. As soon as the rabbi goes outside of the house, the house collapses. So one of the students said to him, says, Rabbi, you're obviously such a righteous man. I mean, just look at what just happened over here. So why are you going through all this suffering? Like, why did God do this to you? Like, why are you sitting over here in such, like, like you're, you're, you're like, no arms, no legs, blind and boils like with the amount of suffering why is it why do you have it so so the rabbi responded and he said you know that one time he was traveling to his father-in-law's house and he had with him three donkeys one donkey was filled with food another was filled with drinks and another one was filled with other delicacies and a poor person came before him and he said you know my rabbi please sustain me i'm starving so the rabbi said, of course, he gets off the donkey and he starts unloading the donkey. And the rabbi says, I hadn't managed to finish, I didn't finish unloading the donkey before this person already passed away. He was so starving, he couldn't even wait until I unloaded the donkey and I get, you know, the, the right food for him. So he's, the rabbi said, I, I, I felt so terrible. He says, I fell, you know, I fell on the floor, I fell on top of him. And I said, you know, my eyes didn't have compassion on his eyes. They should be blinded. And he says, the arms that didn't have compassion, you know, should be taken. And basically, he caused the suffering upon himself as an atonement. He said, what's the point of the eyes? What's the point of the arms? What's the point of the legs? If he's not able to go and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, treat this person with this type of, uh, with this type of mercy. So, uh, this is, this was the, the end of the story of the Gemara. So, explains Rebuvi and Feinstein. Do you want to know the lesson? The lesson that we learn from from this is that Nachamish Gamzu had a mida, a, a a character trait of mercy of Rahmanas. But he had this general concept of mercy. And the general concept of, of mercy is that if somebody goes and is in a dire need, so this 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 character trait of mercy comes out and be like, okay, let me help you, right? The simple example is that if someone's walking in the street and they see someone in need, this arousal of mercy comes up and they go and they help this, per this person. So this is something that lies dormant and when the time comes, it comes, you know, comes out. But if you have someone who examines every single detail of mercy, of kindness, of that 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 the Torah requires? So they don't. There's not a, a a character trait that lies dormant inside of you, but it's rather it's someone that is proactive in this midah, in this character trait of Rahmanas, of, of mercy, meaning that they will work on themselves to familiarize familiarize themselves with all different, you know circumstances of where mercy would be would be needed and they would in, in this particular case 
a person who is very well versed in all this, uh, you know, different topics of chesed, of kindness, of mercy, they would know, they would go and they would research and be like, okay, wait a minute, if someone's so hungry and they're coming and they're starving, that means that if I'm traveling, I should have food ready to give it to that person right away so they don't have to, they don't have to wait. Meaning that the more that you study about something, the more that you understand something, the better that you are going to be at it. So when you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be, I'm a good person and I'm going to do kindness and I'm going to going to be a merciful person. I'm going to be mercy. That's nice. But you'll do that when the opportunity arises and then your brain starts working. Okay, what, what, what is the right thing to do at this point in time? Meaning that if someone goes and asks you for charity, be like, okay, fine. Let me give you uh, some money and then, you know, I, I fulfill the obligation of charity. But if you're someone that delves into the topic of charity, if you're someone that delves into the topic of mercy, then, when a, then, then not only when a situation arises, you know how to respond to that, but you'll be proactive in looking at that situation. So for example, if someone's coming to go and ask you for money, knocks on your door, maybe they're thirsty maybe they're hungry maybe they need to go to the bathroom maybe they don't have a place to sleep and there's so many things that come up but if you're not proactive in it you're not going to come to that conclusion so there's two ways to look at this topic you could look at this topic from an outside perspective meaning that yes you have mercy and when the time comes you will go and you'll utilize your character trait of mercy and you will do the things that you should be doing and you will do it but then there is another aspect where you delve into the depths of it, where you study it and when you understand it and when you could think about how that person would feel, how that person would react, how, what that person needs, then you can come to different realizations of what that person really needs. And again, we'll speak about this more in, in depth when we speak about the topic of, of chesed, of kindness, because this is really under the topic of, of Torah. And the reason for that is because when you learn the Torah, you can learn it in so many different levels on how to do chesed and how to do kindness. And this, explains what Ruben Feinstein, is what Nachamish Gamzu found himself lacking in. He found himself, he said, yeah, he, of course he was on a high level. He had the Midah of Rachmanes as a general directive. But the learning things in a general concept versus learning things in details comes to a very, very big difference. Comes to the difference between life and death. And this explains where Ruben Feinstein is the difference between how the other nations do kindness and the Jew Jewish people do kindness. So the other nations of the world, they do kindness towards each other. They set up organizations and they worry about the needs of the people that are underprivileged. And they do everything that they, you know, that they ought to do. But what's different about Judaism? The difference about Judaism is because when you learn how to do kindness, when you learn how to do chesed, you learn it from the Torah, you learn it in details that the other nations will never be able to come to grasp. They will never be able to come to conclusions that the Torah has because they don't learn the Torah. And this is the difference of when you're going and you're learning Torah and you're going into the depths of it, you can understand things to different levels, levels that you would never be able to reach without it. Rabbi Tversky, Rabbi Dr. Tversky, was a, was a psychiatrist, you know, tell, puts this a little bit on a, different, on a different angle. If you have a person that... Um, you know, has many thoughts, many feelings, and it's very, <sighs> negative is not the right word, but like, it's like bad, you know, like they would never share these thoughts, these feelings with anybody else. They feel it's so reprehensible. It's so like, to the point that they deny them having this this own uh, uh, this own thought because it's like it's like it's so bad it's like wow I can never I can never have such a thought I can never have such a feeling I can never have such a de such a desire so they lied to themselves thinking you know saying no 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 I don't have an issue with this I don't have a problem with this I don't have a you know I don't have these types of uh, of desires so in psychology this uh, this aspect is known as denial uh, but denial comes or comes out with a lot of symptoms that are not healthy there's emotional discomfort there's dysfunction there's uh, uh, in essence it's a, it's a refutation of, of reality the Torah explains Rabbi Tursky he's bringing it from a psychological perspective the Torah has the ability Ability to overcome the denial. How does the Torah have the ability to overcome this denial? Listen to this something very fascinating. So the Gemara tells us that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven to receive the Torah, the angels went to, to Kaddish Baruch they went to God and be like, you're giving the Torah to human beings? Human beings are very corrupt. <laughs> human beings, you're, you're, they're going to violate the Torah. The Torah should stay up here with the angels. So we know the famous Gemara Moshe responded to the, um, to the angels. Be like, well, the Torah forbids swearing for falsely. 
do you do any business that you would need to come to swear? No. The Torah speaks about working on Shabbos. Do you do any work that you have to stop working on Shabbos? Again, no. The Torah speaks about honoring your father and your mother. Do angels have fathers and mothers? No. There's murder. There's theft. There's so many things. In fact, almost everything that the Torah speaks about has nothing to do with the angels. So, you know, says, says, says Moshe to the angel, says the Torah has nothing to do with you up here. The Torah has everything to do with the people down there below in the world. And this, this idea that when the Torah puts in 365 prohibitions, these are 365 prohibitions that people on earth have issues to deal with. Like the Torah says, do not steal. That means that people have temptations to steal. People have temptations to do things. The Torah says, do not act immoral. Meaning that people have temptation to act immoral. You have to eat a certain way. You have to, there's certain things that, that the Torah speaks about because, and warns, because this is the character trait of human beings. We have these issues and the Torah delineates it and says, this is what you should do and this is what you should not do. So there's impulses, there's desires, there's, there's, there's attractions that that people deny having it because it's so reprehensible. They're not good. Oh, of course not. But in essence, if the Torah says that you have this issue, not you, but I'm saying someone can have this issue, that means that people, human beings, natural tendency have this issue. Otherwise, there would be no need to restrict it. So this explains Rabbi Torsky, there's never a reason to be ashamed or alarmed because this is part of the human physical makeup. The mission of the people is to go and overcome this desire, meaning that just because you have the desire doesn't mean that you should go and delve into it, doesn't mean you should go and you should tap into it and whatever it is that you want you should do, you have to work on yourself to overcome it. But the fact that you have it, if you deny it, you'll never be able to overcome it. But if you realize that, you, okay, wait a minute, I have an issue over here. Now, let me work on my, myself and let me come to, you know, to overcome it. That the Pharisee Israel brings down that there was once there's a story with the uh the, there was a he calls it a desert king desert king uh heard about the greatness of moshe Rabbeinu. so he goes and he sends a physiognomist a physiognomist is someone who who is able to describe someone's character traits by looking at their face meaning they could judge a person's character based off their facial characteristics so what this king went this king went to go, uh, he sent artists, he sent, he sent this physiognomist, he sent people out to Moshe Rabbeinu, to the desert, uh, where, you know, Moshe, where Moshe Rabbeinu was at the time, and they drew Moshe Rabbeinu, they took a, you know, a very exact painting, this physiognomist went, and they studied Moshe Rabbeinu, and they came to the conclusion that Moshe Rabbeinu, based on, his, on, on this science, that Moshe Rabbeinu is vain, Moshe Rabbeinu is arrogant, Moshe Rabbeinu is lustful, is greedy, is, you know, a bunch of negative traits. So when the king heard about this, but wait a minute, I heard, I hear about Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, I like, everybody hears about what's going on, Moses is supposed to be like the most righteous person in the world, like, it doesn't make any sense, so the king went and decided he wanted to visit Moshe Rabbeinu himself, and the king went to visit Moshe Rabbeinu, and uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, and, and, and he said, you know, like, I, I, I don't understand, he said, my physi physiognomist went, and they came to the conclusion of all these negative character traits. But I'm looking at you, you don't have these character traits. I don't understand. So Moshe Rabbeinu answered, he says, you know, your people were correct. Your people are correct. Yes, I was born with these struggles. I was born with these issues, but I overcame it. I struggled and I overcame and I refined my character trait. And that is the goal, that is the focus of every person that is placed in this world. We're placed with certain desires. We're placed with certain temptations. We're, 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 we, we have certain uh, um, attractions, certain things, and the goal, the purpose, the reason why we're placed in this world, is where this earth is to be able to overcome it. And that is the reason that we are here and that is the reason that we need to go and work on ourselves. And how do you do that? How do you work on yourself? And that is through the Torah. That is how you're going to be able to overcome all these temptations, all these negative things. That's all through the Torah. And this is one of the reasons why the Torah is placed first. Because the Torah teaches us not only 
how to do the mitzvahs. Not only how to pray, not only how, but it also teaches us on how to build our character and how to work on ourselves and how to develop ourselves to become, you know, a better a better person. People tend to forget this, right? We live life and we get very busy at doing things, right? We're, we're always rushing around. We're, we never stop for a second and be like, okay, wait a minute. What do I need to work on myself? And, and, and I, you know what? I'm going to switch some things around so whoever was on the live could you know, the class right now will be able to know a little bit more what I'm talking about. But recently I spoke to, I had a, a lot of conversations with a lot of people. Uh, um, and so I always want to keep it a little bit more, uh, um, you know, just depending on who listens to this. And I was able to tell, these were big people, and I was able to tell who worked on their midos and who didn't work on their midos. Like, who responded, who who spoke more respectfully, who, who was like more refined character trait and who were not as refined, you know, character trait. And it's very, very interesting because these are, these are, you know, big people that I, that I spoke to. I'm not talking about physically. I and mean, these are big people. So what is, and, and, you know, like not to blame to anybody, not to, you know, not judging anybody, but we get so busy in our life. And, and I'll tell you, like, I didn't even notice it until I spoke to, and then I'm be like, wait a minute. Like, how is it when I speak to people? Like, do I come off as I work on myself or maybe I come off that I don't work on myself and I'm like maybe I should work on myself more because we get so busy in life we're, we're, we're always and we never stop for a second and be like okay wait a minute what do I need to work on myself to become a better person like that we we tend to forget the most important things right we always we're always worried about those little things but we tend to forget the most important things the um you know the Gemara and Shabbos page 38 tells us that the David uh, Melech asked Hakadosh Baruch Hu when he was going to die, and Hashem responded, "You're going to die on Shabbos." So David Melech goes and said, "You know, can I? Can, can we postpone it to like a Sunday or something, or Shabbos? You know, like can we postpone it to Sunday?" So Hakadosh Baruch Hu answered, "He says no. He says we can't. He says the time for your son Shlomo Melech." King Solomon, he is not supposed to. Uh, um, he he was already supposed to be a king by 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 Sunday, so we can we can't push it off. Uh, one king does not en encroach on another king's time, even by by like a second. So David Mel said, "Okay, so if I can't do Sunday, could I do Friday? I don't want to. You know, I didn't want to die on Shabbos. He said, "Can I do a Friday?" So Akedush Baruch Hu said, "I prefer." one day on which you study Torah more than a thousand of the offerings of the karbonos of the sacrifices that your son Shlomo Melch will bring on the you know on the on the on the on the Mizbeach, on the altar. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah tells us that just to like follow up on this, that uh, the, there was the, the house of Eli, they made it they 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 did things that they shouldn't they shouldn't have done. And uh, the to, the Gemara says that they are not going to be per, they're not going to be cleaned by sacrifices forever. Meaning that you can't they can't offer sacrifices and that's going to cleanse them from their sins. But Rab, Rabbah says that okay, sacrifices they won't be able to. But learning Torah that they would be able to. Meaning that what sacrifices, what karbanos would not give them the atonement, Torah could give them the atonement. And here the Zohar Kadir says that from here we learn that Torah has a uh, is more powerful than the karbanas than the you know than than the sacrifices. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was once walking in Yerushalayim, and his student Rabbi Yeshua walked behind him. And Rabbi Yeshua saw the ruins of the base of He started crying. He says, "Who is for us?" Was like, "How are we going to achieve atonement now?" So Rabbi Yochanan said to him, "No, no, no." He says, "What do you mean? We still have an equivalent means of achieving atonement, and that's through Torah study." Through Torah study, we have the ability to achieve things that Karbanas could not give us. And now, even though that we can't give Karbanas, Torah has the ability to, uh, to do that. And in fact, there are, there are certain sins, and we're not going to get into all the details of the sin. We spoke about it many, uh, actually quite a few years ago. But there are certain sins that you need to uh, fast in order to atone it. But instead of fasting, you could go, and, and, and many rabbis say this is the way that you should be doing it, you increase your learning Torah. Your increase your learning Torah, and that atones for for uh, you know for many sins. So we see over here the power of Torah. We see over here the, one of the pillars, one of the foundations of of Torah. Because the hour is getting late, we're going to jump into the next one, which is avoda, which is sacrifices. So avoda, the Gemara in Tainus, page twenty seven b tells us where and not for ma'amodis. Ma'amodis, the Rashi says, is referring to karbanis. Heaven and earth would not exist, meaning that the Jewish people. If they didn't have the, the sacrifices, the sins would 
cause them to ultimately uh, be destroyed. And because the Jewish people will be destroyed, and hence the world will be destroyed, and so on and so forth, therefore the world stands on Karbanas as, as well. So now that we don't have sacrifices, now that we don't have the, um, uh, the Karbanas, that is the, the, what, what took its place is prayer, which is, which is tefillah. So when you look at the Mishnah, and you see that the world stands on three things, on uh, Torah, Avodah, and Gemil Sassadim, so Avodah now is referring to prayer. So, so the real translation is that the world stands on three things. Torah, which is learning Torah, prayer, and good deeds. Now, we didn't have enough time to be able to connect everything because, you know, really, you, look, you listen to the first three classes on this, you can see why, why the, this is so imperative. But this is during a time period, that when, when Shimon HaTzadik said this, this is during a time period when there was uh, a lot of outside influences that the whole focus for for many people were like, okay, maybe I need to focus on other things. And Shema says, no, 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 no. says, you know what you need to focus? You need to focus on Torah, you need to focus on prayer, and you need to focus on good deeds. This is what the world stands on. This is what's going to matter when you get up there after 120. Explains we're moving Feinstein. This is this beautiful idea. Carbon, right? Sacrifices. Sacrifices means uh, the the showish of it, the root of it. Carbon is karav. Karav means to get close. The purpose of sacrifices is to get close to God. Is to get close to God. So now, the question is how? How how is it? And 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 what is it about sacrifices that makes you close to, close to God? So one of the most fundamental concepts is that God gives us everything. Everything that you have is from God. We are undeserving. Uh, everything that we have is not because we earned it, not because we worked hard for it. It's because God gave it to us. It's a gift from God. When someone thinks like this, nothing is, they're, they're not going to pursue something in a forbidden matter. It's like, I can't get something unless God gives it to me. And if God doesn't give it to me, then that means I'm not going to be able to get it. I could get it and then God will take it away, which I don't gain anything from it. But meaning that when you have an understanding that everything that you have is given to you from God, your life is in a completely, you're living life completely differently. So when you look at, let's look at a few carbonos. Um, car, the first carbon we'll look at is an ola. A carbon ola, ola literally means to rise, to ascend. The, uh, the reason why it's called that is that when someone brings a carbon ola, the entire animal is, is burnt on the, you know, on the mizbeach. Meaning that there's nothing, there's no gain coming from that, uh, uh, from that animal. Again, you, you have the hide, but we're not going to get into all that. Basically, the entire animal goes up uh, in flames and it's a carbon for Akadish Baruch Hu. So you think about it and be like, okay, wait a minute. Like, this seems like a waste of money, right? It seems like you're just throwing, you know, like you're not even gaining anything from it. Okay, granted, you have to go and you, you know, give it to charity. Give it. Why is it all this is just going, is is being burnt. And the reason for that is, is that that is the main reason, the main point of this carbon. Meaning that why, why does a person feel bad when they lose money? Because they feel that money is theirs. What would it be when, when someone is giving a carbon and he's bringing the sacrifice and the person gets nothing from this carbon, meaning this carbon gets completely burned on the altar. The Kohanim don't get it, the poor people don't get it, the, everything gets burnt on the, you know, on, on the altar. There's no benefit that comes out from that. So the, the person is going to be like, okay, so wait a minute, so what, you know, he's going to feel bad about it. Like I, I didn't get anything. But if you realize that everything belongs to God, then you'd be like, okay, well, what's the difference? It's not mine either way. It belongs, it belongs to it belongs to God. And that is the point of this carbon. This point of this carbon is like, yeah, you're going to give a carbon, you're gonna give the sacrifice, the sacrifice is gonna be completely burnt, and you're not gonna gain anything from that. You wanna know the lesson from that is the lesson for that is, is that it doesn't matter because it never the money was never yours to begin with. It was only God's money from the begin with. And I remember, you know, years ago, maybe, ooh, maybe. 15 years ago? No, maybe a little bit less. About 15 years ago, I remember I had the secular person reach out to me um, uh, and they were collecting money. They, were, they weren't always secular. They became secular, but they, they went to like uh, some sort of uh, seminary at one point. And they were raising money for their teacher. And I said, okay, fine. You know, like I read the information, a teacher from a seminary from Israel. What well, I don't know. No, it wasn't Israel. It was Russia, maybe it was. And anyways, I read all the deals. Sound sound like a very legit cause. I said, okay, fine. So I gave them, I, I you know, I sent them some money. And when she saw the amount of money, and again, it wasn't like a crazy amount. It, you know, it wasn't $18, but it wasn't a crazy amount. 
you know, she was like, I, I, what would you, I can't believe that like, you're going to give this amount of money. I'm like, what do you I'm like? And I, I, it, I, I can't understand, like, like, what was the shock? Like, because in my mind, I have tzedakah that I have to give. So I have to give it. It's like not my, it's almost not my money. Like, okay, you know, like I don't feel bad when you give tzedakah because, you know, like I have it set aside. That's tzedakah. I can't, like, it's not even mine to begin with. So you don't feel bad about give, giving away somebody else's money. This is not my money. This is Hashem's money. It's easy to give it away. And, you know, this person doesn't give tzedakah, doesn't give miser. So, you know, for this person, like, why would I, why would I, you know, like, I could do so much more with that money, you know, like, why would I just give it away to somebody else? So this is such a huge lesson that if you realize that your money is from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so then you'll give it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You, you know, it's, it's almost like it doesn't hurt, it doesn't bother you. So this is the carbon oil. The carbon oil means that you put it on the, on the Mizbeach and it goes up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and you don't gain anything from it, but that's the lesson, the lesson, lesson that you shouldn't feel bad about it. Because you realize that everything is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everything comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this is why the Pasuk in the Parsha of Karben Ayla, and this is in Vayikra, chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Daber al bnei Yisrael v'amat alhem adam ki yakriv mikem karban. It says over there, the Lushan, the, the terminology is Adam. What's Adam? Why, why specifically Adam? The reason is that it says Adam is referring to Adam Arishan. Adam Arishan, the first man, when he gave a carbon, when he gave a sacrifice, did he feel bad that now this entire sheep was burnt, you know, for, for as a sacrifice? Why would he feel bad? I mean, like, you know, like, there's other sheep that he could just go and take. He owned everything. Meaning, like, if you lose a dollar and you're a trillionaire, dollar doesn't really bother you. I have, you know, so much more. Adam had so many animals. Okay, I lost that. I don't care. I have somebody else. This is the mindset when someone goes and gives a carbon oil. This is the mindset that they need to have. They need to have, okay, wait a minute. I don't, this is not my, this is not my animal. This is all God. If this is all God, so I don't feel bad. Let it all go up in flames. Let it go up to Akadosh Baruch You'll feel no loss whatsoever. And this, you know, you could take it a step further. He, the person could really realize that, you know, you could, a person could take good care of their animals. And then a wild animal can come and just, you know, gobble up a few, a few animals. They, they, it doesn't necessarily mean that the effort that you put in is automatically you're going to have, you know, a good, uh, you know, a good, a good result. You could work hard and the animals can die. You don't have to work so hard and the animals could, could live. Obviously, you have to do your stylus, you have to do your effort. But that doesn't mean that because you do your effort, automatically you're, you know, it's, it's, smooth, it's smooth sailing. Meaning that everything, even the effort, it all depends on God. So... When one brings a carbon ola, this a person realizes that everything everything is is in is in God's hands, and we see this also in in business. You have two people; they open up the same business, they get into the same. One is very successful, and one does is not able to make money. They both put in the same effort. Why? Why is it that one is successful and one is not? This person, God said, I want you to be successful. And this person, God said, I don't want you to be successful. And that's it. So the purpose of this carbon is to realize that everything is from God. But then, explains Rubin and Feitzin, that we take this the next step, becomes a little bit problem, you know, like, what about something like bread? Why, why is bread a little bit different? Bread, in the olden days, there's a lot of steps involved. So an animal, you raise the animal and you go, okay, fine, you know, like, it's, but if you want to take bread, so you have to go and you have to take, you know, the bread. And then, you, you, how do you get the bread? You have to plow, you have to plant, you have to harvest, you have to thresh, you have to go through these processes of wheat until you finally get a loaf of, a loaf of bread. So... You're putting in a lot of effort into it. You're putting in a lot of work into it. You might think, okay, wait a minute. Now this, I have this loaf of bread over here. This is all from me. This is all my, my work. And this explains our movement finds. And this is why we have a carbon mincha. Carbon mincha is grain offerings. Grain offerings specifically because you think that you put a lot of work into it. You put a lot of effort into it. And you know what? This is from me. This is my, I did all this. I worked all this. this. This is the lesson from the carbon mincha is that no, no, no. Even though you put all this work into it, even though you worked so hard on this, you still bring this up as a carbon realizing that all this is still from God. Meaning that even if you work hard on something and even if you're able to succeed in something, you have to realize that too is all from God and has nothing to do with you. Going to the final carbon that we're speaking about is carbon shlomim. And that explains that, like, you have to appreciate what you have when you have it. Um, and and Rabbi Feinstein brings from his father, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, that one time he had a, a chassid that uh, a student uh, uh, that was close to his rabbi and uh, his rabbi invites him over one day and he says i want to give you a you know cup of tea now this student hates cup of 
tea with a passion. But a ra his rabbi gives him a cup of tea and he's so close to his rabbi. He says, oh, of course, he drinks the tea with the rabbi with uh, the greatest pleasure. I'm like, wait a minute, I thought you don't like it. And why are you drinking it now? I'm like, what do you mean? Uh, you know, of course I'm going to drink it. He said, the rabbi, the rabbi, you know, gave it to me. Lahavdil, alf, 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 abdullah. So imagine that you have, uh, you know, the, one, one of the most powerful kings in the world. Dictators of the world. They invite you uh, to come and sit with them. And, uh, I don't know, you really hate apples. And, uh, like, with a passion. And this, uh, this king says, listen, I have the most delicious apples in the world. I have one special just for you. And they give you the apple. You are going to eat that apple, lick your fingers, everything to the bottom, to the, to the pit, and probably including the pit. But you don't like it. Like, what do you mean? He says, the king gave it to me. I was like, how am I not going to go and how am I not going to eat it? The carbon shlomen, different parts are given to different kohanim. So, but let's say a Kohen is sitting over there and be like, you know what? I don't like this part of the animal. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the ribs. I'm not a fan of this. I want a different part of the animal. He says, no, if you got something and if you realize this is from the table of kings, this is from the Melech Malchem, look at my God, this is from the carbon, you're going to take it and you're going to eat it and you're going to be happy about it. Meaning that when you get dealt something in your life, if you realize that this comes from HaKadosh Baruch you'll be, like, you'll be very happy with it. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch for it. And so explains where we find it. We see over here, one carbon after another. What's the main underlining focus? That everything is God. And when you realize everything is only made for God, this, that there's a different level of understanding that you have for life. And this explains where we find it. This is what prayer is all about. When we go and we pray, what are we praying? We're praying, we're saying, listen, God, we know we don't have anything. We know everything is in your hand. Please help us. Help us with pranasa. Help us with refuah. Help us with shalom bayis. Help us with raising our kids. We ask like a because everything is you. I am nothing. I have nothing. And I will never be able to have nothing. It's only from you. Everything is a gift. And hence, this is what we pray. This is what we toughen for. We ask like a you who have everything, who have the ability to give me everything, and I don't have the ability to do anything, then I'm asking you, please provide for me. This is the level, this is the power, this is the lesson, this is the foundation of prayer, because everything falls on prayer. Everything falls on Torah, on Avodah, and Gemila Sasadim. And when we have this concept, then we have another pillar of the foundation of the world. And now we can see why it's so important to have this pillar of prayer. I know I'm going very fast. I'm speaking very fast because I want to try to get through all these three things uh, before, uh, by, by tonight. And I want to jump to the final thing with Chesed. We'll open up to any questions. If I'm not clear, please do, uh, you know, um, feel free to, to, to ask at the end. Chesed, kindness. There was once a potential convert that went over to Hill, Hill Azakin, and he said, I want you to teach me the entire Torah on one foot. So what did, what did, Hill, what did Hill respond? He says, what is hateful to you to not do to your fellow men. He says, this is the entire Torah, the rest is commentary. Meaning the basis, the foundation of the entire Torah is this, you know, don't hurt your fellow friend. It's, it's chesed, it's kindness. And in fact, the, the Pasuk in Tehillim, chapter 89, verse 3, tells us, chesed yamana. The world is standing, it builds on kindness. And in fact, Rabbi Lemelech Melezhinsk would say that even in, this is, in, you know, in his time, <laughs> which is not in our time, which is way before our time, talking almost 200 years ago, Rabbi Lemelech Melezhinsk said, in our times, you know what the world really stands on? In our times, what we really have? It's, it's primar primarily sustained on chesed, on kindness. This is what the world stands on, on the kindness. And we take, take a look at this. We can see this in, uh, in, in the story of Noah. So Noah, the, the, the Medrash, and Barashas Rabbah tells us that Vayisker lekemes Noach. Hashem remembered Noah. What did, what did God remember Noah? What was God's re remembrance of Noah? The Medrash answers that Noah fed the animals. Sustain the animals for 12 months of Teva, and that merit, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, um, you know, saved, saved Noah, saved Noah and his family. So, we could ask, but wait a minute. Noah was an Ish Tzaddik Tamim Haya B'Darasov. He was a righteous man, he was a perfect man. Why did he need a merit? for feeding the animals, and that's what helped uh, you know, him get saved, you know, that Hashem remembered him and took him out of, the, out of the Teva. Furthermore, he had other merits, right? He went and he rebuked all his people, like, he, like the people in his generation. He was building a Teva for over a hundred years. He's sitting there with wooden nails and, and you know, like building, and they were like, what's up, what are you doing, Noach? I'd be like, oh wait, God's gonna send the flood unless you don't repent. Meaning he was rebuking them for so long. That wasn't good enough over there. And, and furthermore, 
he listened to Hakadosh Baruch Hu for everything he said. He went into the teiva. He told the people like he he followed. He has so many other merits that were going. Why specifically is the merit of feeding the animals is what the reason that Hakadosh Baruch Hu saved him? Furthermore, you you can even think about. It, you can you can ask why did he need any merit at all? He was literally the whole purpose of him going to the teiva was that humanity and mankind should survive. Like that was the reason. Why is there have to be some sort of merit? So. The answer is, is that we know that the world stands on three pillars. Torah, prayer, and kindness. He said, what was saving Noah at this time was the kindness that he performed for the animals. That was the only source of merit that would enable him to return to the world. Isn't that like a crazy, crazy chiddush? That's a, such a crazy, crazy chiddush. Th- this is something that when you think about it, also when you think about it, this is kindness to, to animals. You know, like, you, it's not even kindness to people. This is kindness to the animals. He fed the animals, and that, in it, look at how powerful kindness is. Even when you go and you feed animals. Now, I, you have to be kind to animals. You can't, you know, uh, um, harm animals. You can't, like, I, I'm, uh, you know, e- even for my kids, I don't let them kill an animal, like a bug or a fly, if it's outside. Like, if it doesn't bother you, like, why, why are you, like, just, just let it be. Like, don't step in an ant and you're seeing, it, you know, like, walking, let it, let it be. There's no reason why you should go and, and kill even an ant. But when you think about it, be like, okay, wait a minute, like, that's what's going to save humanity? Like, kindness to the animals? Like, okay, it's something you should do. But yeah, even that, that's how powerful, that's the foundation of the world. It's unkindness. Even that is what saves, it's what saves the world. The kindness that Noah had for his, uh, for the animals and that, that he fed them. Rab Chaim Vital says in Shari Kedusha that if a, if a day goes by that a person doesn't learn Torah, doesn't do chesed, it's a lost day. Now, some people can go, they can have a crazy hectic day. They're making a deal over here, they're closing a deal over here, they're, they're, they're running around, they're buying this, they're selling that. They're, and after the end of the day, be like, wow, that was a very productive, you know, productive day. I was able to accomplish so much today. But in reality, they accomplished nothing that day. If they didn't do a chesed, they didn't, do a, they didn't learn anything, they didn't produce anything that day. Then you have somebody who, like, like after a you know, person that likes to be productive, and they're not productive for whatever day, and they feel like, okay, it's a, waste, a wasted day. Uh, they, you know, they learned five minutes. They listened to uh, Torah anytime daily dose. You know, they learned a little bit for five minutes and that was it. And you compare these two people. This person bought buildings, sold buildings, bought homes, sold homes, carts and boats and who knows what. And this other person was, uh, you know, just took a bunch of walks throughout the day and learned for, for five minutes. And you think, who had a more productive day? Most people would say, oh, of course, the businessman. The answer is no. The person that learned for two minutes or five minutes, that person was a more, had a more productive day than the other person. Because if you had a day that you didn't learn anything was, or you didn't uh, do any sort of kindness, wasted day. But if you did do something, that's a day that you gained something from it. And Rav Pam says that this you can see even from, from Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu, when he, took, he, wanted, he wanted to take care of the needs of the three angels, Avram didn't need to take care of the angels, meaning that if he had an, if somebody had an excuse, it was Avram. You, you're talking about a really, really elderly gentleman that had a bris milah, gentleman, you know, a really elderly, you know, tzaddik that had a bris milah that was sick, that was not feeling well, it was extremely hot. All the reasons Avram Avinu had checked off that he would be able to not do any chasen and he would be good. But you know what? That would not be a productive day. That would be, and Avram Avinu experienced more pain by not doing the kindness than by doing the kindness. Kindness. That's the, the a day without kindness for Abravinu was an empty day, and that's why he needed to do the kindness. This is the foundation, the pillars of the of you know of the world. When you look at the wording of charity, when you look at the wording that the Torah speaks about, the the pasuk in Devarim chapter fifteen verse eight, it says ki pasayach tiftach es yadcha. Yeah, it says a, a double language pasayach tiftach, and it says nasan titen. It also also tells you the, the like the, it, it's kind of the same word in a little bit differently, but it said it, it said it twice. What's the purpose of saying it twice? So it says the Makubu Rabbi Yaakov Hillel that there was once a poor person that went to. Ask a rabbi for a donation. 
And the rabbi looks at this poor person and he sees, you know, tat- you know, like the, the mercy really comes out, like tattered, cl- ripped clothing. It was like very skinny and you could see the bones. Felt really bad, gave him some charity and the old man, you know, went, uh, went on his way. The old man looks at it and sees, wow, he got a nice, a nice amount. So, you know, he's very happy with, the, you know, the amount of money he just made and he's walking away. All of a sudden, he sees the rabbi is chasing back to him, calling him, wait, 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 wait. And this this poor person thing is like, oh my gosh, he says, this, uh, he probably thinks he gave me too much money, he wants to uh, ask me for a change. So this poor person starts walking faster. And the rabbi starts chasing him, and they start chasing him, and he says, no, 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 finally the rabbi catches up to him, and the poor person, you know, finally stops and says, you know, yeah, well, well, you know, what, what, what can I do for you? Thinking that he has to just now give back some money, and the rabbi takes out additional money and gives it to him. And he takes it, and he's like, he's like, you gave me already. He says, "Yeah, no, I know. I, now I, I want to give you. Uh, I want to give you again." So he says, "You know, like what was the reason that the rabbi wanted to give him again?" And the reason is, is because when a per, when the, the, poor, the poor person came and asked for money, the rabbi had some mercy and and aroused, like, "Look how terrible!" So he gave him a nice amount of the money. But afterwards, he's thinking, "Be like, wait a minute." He says, "I gave him the money because I felt bad. So I gave them that money." Because it, it made me feel good. That means that I didn't give the money for the right reasons. I'm supposed to give the money because I'm supposed to give the money. I'm supposed to give charity. So then after he gave the money and now he, you know, he feels better, he says, now I have to give the money. And then he chased after him and then he gave him again. This is why the, the Pasuk says, Nelson Titan says, it says it twice because sometimes you have to give, you have to give, uh, you have to give twice. And, uh, you know, Rav Palm also says, uh, you know, sometimes you have somebody that comes over to you ask you for charity, makes the rounds, come back in, ask for charity two or three times. After the fourth time, you get upset and be like, I gave you already. Like, why do you keep on coming? But explains the Chavetz Chaim, says that's a wrong attitude that you should have. If somebody comes and asks you for money, and then they come and they ask you again for money, you know, like, this is something that you, it, it, like, imagine you own a store, and you have a customer, and five minutes later, the customer comes back in and buys more. And 10 minutes later, they come in and they buy it again. And 15 minutes later, they come in and can buy it again. Be like, well, I, enough already. I sold you already. Why do you keep on coming back? No. A storekeeper would never say no to a customer. Come back a million times. I don't care. The more you come, the better off I am. So I want you to come. I want you to come back. Says the Chavetz Chaim, just like a storekeeper who wants to sell more merchandise to the same person, so to you that if someone comes and collects money and wants to ask you for money and you gave them already, give them again. Give them again because it's a mitzvah. It's a, it's a great deed. This is what you're saving you're when you give charity you're really giving to yourself more than you're giving to the other person repeat customers everybody's happy with repeat customers and this is also a repeat customer when you have someone and it gives you uh you know for you know for charity i remember when i was in uh israel i was uh sitting in uh, like i was davening in this um in this shul that in like in a place in Yerushalayim where you know it wasn't let's call it the American uh, it was Israelis that sat and learned all day and you know they didn't uh, let's just say they didn't make you know a lot of money and and you know you had their people collecting money and I just landed so I had only dollars so I you know I gave uh, you know I gave you know I gave some dollars here and you know I guess back then this is you're talking about it quite a few years ago people saw a dollar come out they became excited that you start making circles and there was one guy that came more than more than once and you know and i kept on giving okay i kept on giving the you know more more money and somebody came over to me afterwards and asked me says you know you gave this guy multiple times and he keeps on coming back to you and i was like yeah no i i realized that and he says why why you keep on giving him back so I, I i said honestly he says I, when he came back to me i was thinking why should i give him i gave him already but then i was thinking and be like you know what i go to god and i ask god can you give me x y and z and god gives me x y and z and then i'm like okay god now can you give me a b and c and i'm like i keep on going to god three times a day and says can you give me this can you give me that can you give me this can you give me that and it's like i keep on asking this broker for more and more and more and more somebody else also keeps on asking me says i shouldn't emulate me shouldn't give more and more and more in fact i want to Baruch to answer me also more and more so it's an extra merit that just every time i want to ask something you know i'm asking again but like yeah okay but at least i i gave twice or three times to this person as well so when we think about it, so we're repeat customers to Agadish Baruch Hu. So if we want to be able to be answered, we should also give when people go and ask for, uh, you know, ask for, ask for money. But we could also learn ad- additional things from, uh, for, you know, regarding the chesed. And that is that when you look at the hospitality of Avram Avinu, I know it's getting a little bit late, so we'll finish it off a little, in, in, in a, a little bit. I don't know how many minutes, but a few minutes. The, uh, when Avram Avinu was sitting uh, at his tent and waiting for guests, he didn't have anything prepared for them in advance. When they came, the three angels came, then 
Sarah started to bake. He ran to slaughter animals. Now, to slaughter animals, it's a process. You have to take the meat. You have to salt it. You have to, you know, there's there's a bunch of process. You have to skin it. There's a bunch of process in, in you know, in, you know, in the meat. If Avram Avinu was so big into chesed, why didn't he have a whole feast already prepared to them? So explains Rabbi Ruben Feinstein. He says, first, he says, imagine there's two, two people. Two people that are guests. The first guest, he had to be away for Shabbos. He had a relative that was in the hospital, and he had to be away for Shabbos. So he went over to a local shul, and he asked the people over there, he says, listen, I have a relative nearby over here in the hospital. I don't have a place to eat. Who could I go ask for eat? So they point to this one wealthy guy over there that often has guests. Go, go ask him. And he goes and he asks him if he could join him for the meal. The, the, the guy says, absolutely, not a problem. It would be our pleasure. And he goes over to this guy for Shabbos, and this guy had a feast prepared and all the delicacies, unbelievable spread that he had from the meats and the wines and everything. It was unbelievable. Then you have a second man. A second man was traveling for business, and he davened at a local minion where, where, where he was traveling. And all of a sudden, he's davening over there, and he sees in the corner, he says, wait a minute, I know that guy. He goes over, and he realizes it's one of his closest friends from the days of yeshiva many, many years ago. So they, they start schmoozing, they start catching up. And this, uh, you know, this friend says, uh, you know, like, I know you're traveling here. Where are you eating uh, breakfast? So I was planning on eating it by the hotel, you know, I was going to, you know, get a few things. So he says, no. He says, why are you going to tell? Come to my house. So he comes over to the house and he goes and he tells his kids quickly run to the grocery, buy this, this, and this. And, they, you know, they bought a bunch of stuff and they put in a, you know, decent spread on the, you know, for the breakfast. After they finished breakfast, this, uh, you know, the, the host said, listen, to his guests, he said, listen, I, I didn't know that you were in town. I didn't prepare, uh, you know, something that's, my covetic for you, something that you deserve. He says, do me a favor. Run around with whatever you need to do with your business. Come back to lunch. I want to prepare for you a meal like you deserve. So the guy says, you know what? I would be able to. I do have the time. He says, yeah, not a problem. He comes back and there's a huge feast over there. He says, all these meats and all the wines, all these delicacies. And he goes and he eats it and they have a, they, you know, a great time. Now you look at these two guests. Both of them at the end of the day had the same type of meat, same type of wine. Which one appreciated it more? The one that was eating by the wealthy man that I was going to have it anyways, he said, okay, fine, he had it for him, and I you know, ate part of his thing. Of course, I'm grateful, of course, I'm thankful, but he ate it for him. But the second guy, the guy that was, a, that was his close friend, that he made it special for him, says, wait, well, he made all this food special for me. He says, there's a different level of, of, of appreciation that he has, because look at what this, that my friend did just for me. And in fact, the Gemara and Brachas, page 58a, says, you know what a good guest is? A good guest is, is not like the first guy. It says, oh yeah, everything that he made, he was going to make anyways, and I just ate. A good guest is that the host gave, did everything for me. That's a good guess, because then you could start appreciating it more. When Avram Avinu was going and he wanted to prepare something for his guests, he says, no, 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 I'm not preparing it in advance just so that, you know, like I'll have something and I'll be like, okay, I had the food anyways, why don't you come join me? He says, no. He says, he, when, when the three guests came, he says, I'm preparing this special for you because you are very special to me. I, uh, you know, I so appreciate that you're coming to me. I'm going to make a special feast just for you. It's a different level of Achnasas Archem. It's a different level of, of of, of like of, of chesed of kindness that Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu had, and the Avos Rav Nassim tells us that Eiv was going through terrible suffering, and he went over to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, he went over to God. He says, God, I don't understand. He says, I gave people food to eat and and wine to drink. I gave you know I I, I gave so much chesed. So Hashem answered him. He says, Eiv, all your deeds did not even come to half of what Avram Avinu would do. It says the way that you did chesed was that somebody who usually eats bread, you gave him bread. Somebody who usually eats meat, you gave him meat. Somebody who usually drinks wine, you gave them wine. Meaning that you made everybody comfortable in the level that they were. Avram Avinu was different. Avram Avinu would go around, search for guests. When he found them, he would bring them all the delicacies in the world. And if somebody never had wheat bread before, he would make them wheat bread. If someone never had meat before, he would give them meat. If someone never had wine before, he would give them wine. Avram made sure to always do it a step above everything else. So Kedush Baruch told Eiv, says, you know what you did? You did was tzedakah. Avram was chesed. Avram did something above and beyond. He showed people how much he, th- he, he thought of them. Now, I, I, I want to just like stop this for a second. And if you think about, just like, this is a very simple concept, right? It's a very simple concept of hachnasas archem. But yet, if you, ne- like, most people would never even think about this. 
You have a guess? Okay, fine. So, you know, I made a nice dog save. But if you, you never think about, okay, wait a minute, let me make something special just for this guest. Let me make this person feel special. The, chesed, the, the, the way that you're able to even learn on how to do chesed is from the Torah. You have the ability to be able to go and understand what chesed is all about. There's so much here that we don't even realize that we have to learn. Meaning that you think, okay, fine, wait, I do a lot of kindness. I host people. I cook for people. I do that. You don't even realize on how many levels there are. And this is what we started off. We started off with different things about chesed, different things about, you know, the way nachamish gamzu. We never even realized that there are so many things we never even tapped into. There are so many things that we think we come to the conclusion that we're okay where we are. We're doing a good job. And the Mishnah tells us, no, 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 you got to go into the delve into these things. Torah, Avodah, Gmail, Zanim, this is the foundation of everything. See, the time of Shimon and Tzadik, there was a lot of outside influences, just like there is today. And the outside influences were telling you, you're fine the way that you are. You know what? Focus on this. Focus on this physicality. Focus on this. Don't, and they would, they would take their focus elsewhere. And Shemana Tzadik says, no, this is what you need to focus on. And when we think, okay, fine, wait a minute, we do Torah, we do Avodah, we do Chesed. No, 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 this is the pillars, this is the foundation of the world, meaning that you have to delve deep into it. Because the more that you delve into it, the, real, the more you realize, oh my gosh, I'm lacking so much in it. There's so much that I don't even do that I don't even understand. Like how many of us went and we had some sort of, uh, you know, guest that we had and we said, you know what, I'm making something special just for you. And to do the whole thing just for that person to make that person feel special. How how many times do you give charity that you say, you know what, no, I, let me give that person again because I gave just because I felt bad. Let me double down. Let me give twice again. Because if you think about it in the secular world, I gave. I'm good. I checked off the boxes. That's it. I'm a righteous saint. I'm good. I'm bad. You know, I pass go and collect $200. So, but if you learn it in the Torah, you realize the foundation. You realize how much you can learn from it, how much you can grow for it. And this is also in our, in our character traits. Like how many times do we go through life thinking that we're great people? And then all of a sudden we have like a wake up call and be like, you know what? Maybe I do need to work on myself. Maybe I do need to focus a little bit on my character building things. <clears throat> I want to finish off with one thought. Rav Moshe Leib Sasov said that he learned true Havas Yisrael, true love of a Jew from a drunken person. So, so he overheard as one drunken person say to another drunken person, he said, do you love me? And all the guys are like, of course I love you. You're my best friend in the whole world. You know, like slurring over the world and they're like crying over each other. I love you so much. No, I love you so much. And then like one drunk got like really serious. And he's like, you do love me? And he's like, yeah, for sure I love you. And I'm like, do you know what I lack and what pains me? And the other guy, the other drunk is like, he's like, what? He's like, I know. So the, this drunk says, says, how can you say that you love me if you don't even understand my pain? You don't even understand what I'm missing. So this so explains from Moshe Leib of Sazam, says, this is, the, this is a lesson that I learned from the drunks. So says, you want to know how to love another person? You want to know how to do correct kindness, correct chesed? Do you know that other person? Do you know what that other person is going through? Do we ever stop? We have so many interactions in our day. Do we ever stop and be like, you know what? I have a coworker. I have a friend. I have a, like, they're going through so much. Is there something that I can do? to alleviate their pain. Now, sometimes you can't. Like, sometimes people are going through something and they they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to deal, you know, like, maybe you have to go through it in a roundabout way. But in other times, you could go and you could, you know, try to tap in and be like, you know, what's going on? You know, like, I'm here for you. Like, let's talk about it. Like, what can I do to help you? Like, there's so many situations that we, we don't even realize that we have an opportunity there. And, you know, this is, Rabbi Yona explains, you know, like, chesed, is greater than charity. Why? Because chesed can be done to the rich and to the poor. It can be done to everyone. It, like, like It's something that we have so much opportunities that if we don't look at it and we don't delve into it, we won't come to the realization of what's lying right in front of us. And this explains Shem This is the Mishnah. The Mishnah tells us the world stands on three things. You know what a stand on three things? That's a pillars. Pillars means that you have to have a good foundation. It doesn't mean that you check off the boxes. I learn, I do, I pray, and I do, uh, you know, I do kindness. No, no, pillars means that it's a foundation. Your foundation has to be very, very strong. That means that you have to really delve into the foundation and realize, okay, what do I do? I need to work. It says, okay, so I prayed, but do I concentrate on the words? Do I know what I'm talking about? Do I realize who I'm praying to? Do I realize that everything is from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Okay, so I understand Torah. Torah is very important. But wait a minute. Do you understand that Torah is the foundation of everything? It's how you're supposed to do everything? That you can learn chesed from Torah. You can learn more, and you should.
learn morality from Torah? Do we, do, we, do we delve into that? Or most of us, how do we deal with our morality? We, okay, fine, this is good, this is not good. We kind of decide it based on the society. And then when it contradicts with the Torah, we'll be like, okay, we're a good Jew and we'll, we'll focus on the Torah. But that's not the correct, that's the correct aftermath. But the correct way is that you delve into the Torah at the beginning and be like, you know what? I know I need to work on this. I know this is the right path. I know this is what I need to because I delve. It's a pillar. It's a foundation. I know deep into it. A chesed. Do you do chesed because, okay, fine, you feel bad. You have Rachmanis, you had like, you know, like Nechemish Gamzi, you're a good person, you do Rachmanis, or do you delve into the to the kindness and you know what you're dealing with and you're and you and you really go into the depths of it and you'll be able to not have something dormant, but actually something that you can be proactive in it. And this is such a fundamental important aspect, such an important idea that you go and you delve into these subjects because the more that you delve into it, the more that you'll be able to realize how much you there's room to grow and how much there's room to improve yourself. So this is what the Mishnah is teaching us. The Mishnah came again at a point of time there was a lot of distractions. And today, we could say that times a thousand. There's a lot of distractions. And we get confused. We get very confused. We focus on this. We focus on that. We focus on the wrong things. It says, But if we are able to delve into these three things, these foundations, we be able to recalculate our route that we're going on, the path of the life that we're going on. We'll be able to follow the right path, the path of the Torah, the path of prayer, the path of chesed, the correct way. And we'll be able to come to the realization of where we need to end up in and what we need to do. And with that, Mashiach will, Be'ezat Hashem, come. Before we end off and ask for, uh, uh, open up to any questions, which I don't see that we have, so we may not have that, but we will say with one capital to Helen for Klal Yisrael, for the situation in Israel, for all the soldiers that are in uh, Gaza. As usual, we say capital chapter Kuf Lament chapter 130. <laughs> Yachel Israel al Adonai ki ma'adai no yachazed v'arbei imay fedus v'hu yiftes Israel mikol avon esav achinu kol beis Israel hanesunim batzara v'ashev yahaimdim bein bayam uvein bayabasha hamokam yirachim aleim v'yitziem mitzara lirvacha umafela le'ara mishibud legula hashta bagala bezman kariv and amar amen. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Anybody else that wants to join us, you can <coughs> reach out and be uh, and, and join us on the WhatsApp group, and then you'll have all the details of the classes. Until next time, may everyone have an amazing, amazing, successful life. Yeah, we always say week, we always say Shabbos. Have a successful everything. All righty. <laughs>